There are few things in life that I enjoy more than fishing. Hunting has become one of them. There aren't many places in the Northeast where world-class hunting and fishing collide. Sandy Neck Beach on Cape Cod is on that very short list of locations. When I get the chance to go hunting and fishing on the same day, and I get to do both in a beautiful setting while joined by my dog, I'm a very happy man. In late October, two great events converge on Sandy Neck Beach. The fall striped bass migration is going full throttle, and the dunes behind the beach are getting stocked with ringneck pheasant. This is a magical time to be a sportsman on Cape Cod. For $40, you can get an off-season pass that allows you to drive about five miles of the pristine shoreline along Cape Cod Bay. It's a beautiful place that offers a great escape. Many people don't realize that trout aren't the only thing stocked by local fish and game agencies. Most states also offer a robust pheasant stocking program. It offers a way to get people outdoors, in touch with nature, to enjoy its beauty, and to give them a reason to commit to its preservation. On Sandy Neck, birds are stocked twice a week during the season, which runs from mid-October through Thanksgiving. Finding them on any given day is no guarantee, but if you have a good dog, odds are you'll bring home a bird or two. All right, we just rolled in here on trail one. Uh, we're gonna cut into the dunes here. Normally, you're not allowed to walk out in the dunes. Very fragile ecosystem. Only time you're allowed to enter the dunes is if you are either hunting or if you are foraging. There's beach plums out here, there's wild cranberries. Um, but other than that, it's pretty strictly enforced that you're not supposed to be mucking around out in the dunes. Hey, good boy, hey, good boy. Good boy. Training a dog to help you catch food is an extremely rewarding experience. And watching the enthusiasm in a good bird dog doing its thing is an incredible sight. Nine years ago, as luck would have it, a friend of a friend's dog delivered a litter of Chesky Fosek pups. It was a breed I had never heard of, but after doing some research, I realized I needed to have one. Chesky Foseks, which are also known as Bohemian wire-haired pointers, originated in Czechoslovakia and have only recently been introduced to the United States. They've been rigorously bred for intelligence and hunting ability, not for a certain coat, color, ear length, or other unique physical trait. Training him to hunt was ridiculously easy. These dogs are hardwired to find a bird, hold a steady point, and then make the retrieve. But you don't need a fancy dog to hunt birds. My first hunting dog was a mix of Doberman, Corgi, Boxer, and Dalmatian. Molly is a mix of Black Lab and who knows what else. She's owned by my friend and co-worker, Billy Dean. These two dogs have been hunting side by side for eight years now, and they make an incredible team. Yeah, it's rare to get more than two shots on a pheasant. So I like the over-under just because it's lighter, it's easier to swing. What do you get in there? Get in there. Get in there. Hunt him up. Right there. Yes. <laughs> All right, game on here. <laughs> I know you're gonna shoot one. <laughs> I'll take him on the ground. I'll take him in the air. I'll take him anywhere I can get him. I'm up, Molly. Go we'll get him. Retrieve him. Come here, Molly. You're right. Good eye, Billy. I don't know, Mom. Grab him. Oh, there he is. He's running. Yeah. Woody's on him. Woody's got him. Good boy, Woody. You got a birdie? You grab him? No, he's pointing. Okay, let's see him. 
Yeah. I'm up, Woody. I thought he went way that way. Though. Which way do you think he went? I thought he went that way. I thought he went right down that way. But that's Woody. I trust Woody better than me. bird was so we were just starting to walk in off the trail Billy actually spotted a, a nice cock pheasant on the ground on what's that she wasn't we I choose on a rabbit back there. I think I saw it a couple yeah. times and she was just going around in a circle thick in there I'll tell you yeah that. I know yeah I'm I took a shot at it on the ground which normally I don't do but it was I thought a good shot at the time um, but we're having trouble finding it, so. He's gonna find it. Is that a hawk? Yeah, big hawk. Well, the hawk's gonna eat too. <laughs> My only thought is keep going back this way to the trail. We'll get the wind coming in this way. That's fine. So Sounds good to me. Just stay on the direction it was heading. It's weird, I don't see any tracks over here where he was. I just wonder if because that rain compacted the sand. Yeah, maybe. Yep. So you can track them. It's never a good feeling when you leave a potentially wounded animal in the field. But after 20 minutes of searching, we decided to move on and check back on this location at the end of the hunt. Walking around in the dunes at Sandy Neck is like walking on the moon. It's a seriously unique ecosystem where everything seems different. It's a harsh environment, much like a desert, but certain plants and animals have managed to thrive here. This is just such cool terrain being out here. It's like a giant crater here. Almost feels like you're walking on the moon. Yeah, I did too. Where did he come? Good girl, Molly. Molly did her job and flushed a hen pheasant, but Bill and I both whiffed on the shot. Fire up again. Yep. <laughs> that was a big hen. That was. I think it double take it for a I was, like, I was wondering why you weren't shooting. Yeah, I wasn't sure what I'm shooting at. I don't know what I can over here. You're usually better tracking than me. I picked my eye off. Yeah, it went this way. What do you got, Woody? All right, you stay down here, Billy. I'm going to go around. Okay. Where's that birdie? I bet that bird we just shot at was in this bush initially. That's my guess. The trail's right here. Neither of us had a clean shot at the third pheasant of the morning. Another one gets away and earns its freedom. Where'd you see those tracks? I think you could go just about any place on earth, no matter how remote. And you'd still find these nip bottles. That one's been out here for a while. <laughs> I hate these things. I do too. Where's that birdie?
After a long and frustrating morning hunt, the dogs were running out of gas, so we decided to switch gears and drive the beach in search of some feeding striped bass. So we're just driving down the beach here. You got six miles of beach that you can drive here in Sandy Neck. And looking for birds working, didn't see much, but all of a sudden just saw some fish crashing right in the surf line. Almost looked like false albacore, which is really unusual for Cape Cod Bay, but they have been in there this year. So we're gonna take a few casts, see what we can find. Yeah, it definitely did not look like stripers or bluefish. It was like, and it wasn't far out at all. Fish on! You got a little schoolie here. It's getting late in the season. It's mid-October. There'll probably be fish around on Sandy Neck here into the first week of November. It's not very big, but I'll take them. Any fish late in the season is a good fish. Throwing the Z-Man Hercules. A lot of times the fish here, they're right off the first lip of the beach. You don't necessarily need to cast fire to catch them. You know, just working the bottom seems to be the trick. Any kind of jig, soft plastic. What do you think of that, Woody? Huh? That's a weird looking bird, huh? What do you think? You wanna give him a kiss? All right, let's let him go. See you next year. Yeah, there's not a lot of places in the world where you can hunt pheasant in the morning catch a striper right in the same spot. Very cool scene out here, I love it. Woody likes it too. What do you think of that fish, Woody? Is that weird? Woody's very confused about this whole fishing thing. Edge of the beach. Yeah, like 10 feet out. There's one. I don't think he's very big, but I'll take it. What do you think about that, Woody? Huh? What is that thing? You're not, you don't seem very impressed. Not a monster, but a nice, fat, little, healthy fish. The colors are really green on them, it's all sand here. They get real white like that when they're in the sand. What do you think, Woody? Huh? What is that thing? You're not, you're not gonna point it? All right, let's get this guy back in the water. Where'd it go, Woody? Bill, you find that a lot of times the fish are just kind of right off that first lip? Absolutely. They just kind of ride along the edge and come and go? Yeah, so you don't have to cast very far to get into them. Look at that, Woody, huh? Number three. Our third fish of the day, little guy, little striper. Nice little fish. Can't complain when you're catching anything on a beautiful day like this. Late October, season's winding down to an end. Oh, no, you can't eat it, Woody. No eating it. Watch this. Where'd he go? Where'd it go? I managed not to catch my dog yet, so that's a win. Oh, there you go, Billy. <laughs> Don't screw it up. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think that is a bluefish. Yep. Oh! Yeah, it was a bluefish. <laughs> well, I wanted him for the grill. It just washed up on the beach with yeah, snake. that's why. Peanuts here. This is a time of year when we're not expecting to find any big fish in here, although it certainly is a possibility. 
it. You know, the migration going on, all these fish are moving south. Some of them just come and kind of work along this, this beach, head into the Cape Cod Canal and find their way south. And it's really hit or miss this time of year. You'll have days where there'll be birds everywhere and tons of fish and other days there'll be a steady pick. That's kind of what we're seeing today. And as far as tides go here, generally you're going to find better fishing towards the higher tide. Water gets real skinny on the low tide. We're coming up on high tide, probably another hour here. I moved to Cape Cod after graduating college in 1996. In my 28 years of fishing here, I've witnessed a notable trend. Southern species of fish are on the move north. As sea temperatures continue to rise, it seems like new species appear every year. About six years ago, Atlantic Bonito started showing up in good numbers in Cape Cod Bay. Before that, it was rare to see them north of Cape Cod. 2024 marked the first year that false abacore appeared in good numbers north of the Cape. This was the first time in my life I've witnessed albies inside of Cape Cod Bay. Anglers from as far north as Gloucester and Provincetown were getting in on the action. Being able to chase crashing albies down the beach in my truck was a first for me. We were getting a lot of shots into breaking fish, but as is usually the case, false albacore are a challenging fish to catch. Chasing albies would be Sandy Neck Beach. Oh, I felt whacked. I'm tight. I'm tight. Now these could be Benito. Oh, I thought it dropped to me, which is charging me. This is awesome. Hands down, my favorite fish to catch from shore. Came out here just expecting to catch a couple of schoolies. Maybe a bluefish. And I am pretty certain I am tied into an alley. It's pretty incredible just to see them in these waters, never mind hook into one from the beach. We catch these fairly commonly on the south side of Cape Cod. I live in Falmouth, and it's a realistic fishery to go out and expect to catch one from the shore down there. But Cape Cod Bay, the water is just much colder. And we were just about to hang it up. We were just driving down the beach. Matt, the camera guy, happened to be looking out the window in the right spot. And they were just absolutely raging in a feed right up in the surface. Got back in the truck twice, tried to run them down. <laughs> Finally got up ahead of them. Got a single hook crippled herring. Leave it hanging in the back of my truck. Pretty much all summer long, just for this reason. And I just so happened to hit them right on top of the head. And an epic feed, close enough to shore. And I, I've been hearing people say that when they're up here in Cape Cod Bay, they're not nearly as finicky as they usually are. I got a 30 pound test leader, which normally I fish around 15, even sometimes 12 pound test leader. That is 100% an Albi. It's not a Benito. <laughs> yeah! Look at that. Beautiful, nice sized fish. Just oh such God. powerful creatures. They're in the two and a family. He's going to do the two and a head shake. It's really the, the fastest, hardest running fish you're going to find around here. Absolute blast when you hook into these things on light tackle. That got me fired up. <laughs> Before leaving the beach, I made the decision to take Woody back to the spot where I shot at the pheasant earlier in the morning. 
It wasn't far from the beach, and as a hunter, the ethical thing to do is to make the best possible effort to retrieve a potentially wounded animal. The more I thought about it, the bird never flew away, oh. which means I probably hit it. Come on. Where's the birdie? Where's the birdie? Fetch. Birdie. Is he in there? Is there a birdie in that bush, Woody? He's locked up on something in this bush. Let's say trust your dog. Where's that birdie? Huh? Is he in there? Is there a birdie in there? Woody, is there a birdie in that bush? Huh? Get in there. Where is it? Get in there. Now as a pointer, he really won't flush the birds. Really in their DNA just to hold point. So when it comes time to flush, that's actually my job. Took me a lot of years to realize that, that the pointing dog is not supposed to be a flusher. I don't see anything, buddy. Oh. Woody, you go boy. Woody! Woody, you go boy. It's right here. You found it. Oh, yes. You want a parade? You want to do a parade with it? Good boy, Woody. Good boy. We found it. It was uh, probably 150 yards away from where I initially shot at it and came back in a second time to give it a good honest second look and lo and behold Woody lit up in a big pile of scrub and we have our bird. Good boy Woody. Good boy. He always likes to do a little parade with him before he hands him over. Woody you get that birdie. Good boy. So this is a male pheasant, also called the rooster. Some people call them cocks. And just absolutely brilliant birds. Um, the coloration on them is incredible. The females are a lot more drab in color. They're pretty much just brown. Um, but these are impressive. This is a good sized bird, probably goes about three and a half pounds. And these birds aren't native to the United States. They were brought over in the late 1800s. Um, they were brought over from China. They originally went to Oregon. Guys started to farm out there and they slowly started spreading across the country. And back as late as the 1950s, there were wild populations of these birds and hunting them was a big part of life back then. Um, but mainly due to urban development and mainly due to an increase in predators like hawks and owls after they stopped using the DET, a lot of the bird predators came back. And slowly but slowly, these things all but disappear. I think there's still a wild population on Block Island but it's exceptionally rare for these birds to survive just because there's not enough of this kind of habitat for them to live in. Oh, good boy, what do you, oh, you want a feather? <laughs> so the state does an incredible job stocking them. A lot of people don't realize it. They realize the state stocks trout two times a year, um, but there's also a big stocking program paid all for by hunting licenses for ringneck pheasant. And it's a great, it's a great program. I've really gone grown fond of it. Hunting with your dog is an awesome experience. Um, the whole thing, it's a beautiful place. You're out here on a beautiful day. Sometimes you get a bird, sometimes you don't. Today we, we went one for three, which is not great, but I'll take it. Where are you, good boy? You wanna smell on one last time? Good boy. Good boy, Woody. All right, the other really cool thing about hunting out here in the dunes at Sandy Neck is you have these natural cranberry bugs. These things have been here for thousands of years. Um, th this, this is how cranberries would naturally grow in very, you know, sandy areas like this. And believe it or not, this little patch is actually pretty well loaded with cranberries. Brought my berry picker out. You can get these on Amazon, 15 bucks. Great little tool. And we're gonna pick a few cranberries to go along with our lunch. Come on, buddy, some water.
All right, on today's science lesson with Andy, we're gonna learn how to shuck a bird. Now, I was never officially taught this by anybody. I just kind of figured it out through trial and error. I could be doing this completely wrong, but it works for me. If anybody's got a better idea, let me know. So we want to start with the bird breast side up, legs towards us. We're going to pinch the skin. Just make a short cut, just enough to get a finger in there. And we're just going to pull the skin back to expose the breast. So here you can see two fine pheasant breasts. There's a bone that runs straight up through the middle. I like to use a short knife for this. You don't want a long fillet knife. The shorter the blade, the better. I'm going to cut in towards that central bone. And you cut straight down until you hit another bone. Once we get that, we angle the knife away and just slowly work towards the back. You want to make sure you don't get into the guts. And once again, just work the knife against the bones. And when we get to the wing, there's one main tendon that can be tough to cut through. Now we just need to peel that away from the skin. Those feathers off of there. And we'll wash those up at the end, but there you have it. One of the kind of odd things with pheasant is the fat on it has that orange color to it, which kind of freaked me out the first time I ever cut one, but that is normal. So now we just repeat that on the second side along the wing bone. Get as much of that blood off of there as I can. And I got a bucket of salt water here from the ocean. Might as well brine them. Now it's time to do the legs. So step one on getting the legs off is we're gonna cut the leg so we have our two legs and thighs here. We're gonna peel back the skin on those. Normally I don't wear these lunch lady gloves I'm wearing now, but I don't have any running water here. Trying to be somewhat sanitary. And the leg bone connects to the hip bone. I'm gonna pop that. I should pop right out. Cut that down to the skin. And there's one leg quarter. Now, kind of similar to a chicken, the legs and the thighs cook differently. So the legs and the thighs, I really like to slow cook. I do a pheasant leg confit where you slowly cook them at like 200 degrees, covered in oil with a lot of salt. And that's my favorite way to use the leg quarters. We pop the hip bone. Now you could certainly pluck the whole bird and serve it like a whole roast turkey. But the problem with that is this bird did not die of natural causes. You know, we have little bits of lead in there. When you break it down like this, you can see where the pellets go in. And actually, both these legs are very clean. I didn't see a single pellet in it. We're going to save these for another day, pack them away in the cooler. And that's all that's left. There's not really enough meat in the wings to make it worth going after. I tried it once, I'll never try it again. All right, did you forget about those cranberries? I did not forget about the cranberries. We're going to get a nice little sauce going with those. For our sandwiches, pick out the leaves, a little bit of salt water to it. I'm just going to break these down into a sauce onto the fire. So now we're going to prep our pheasant breasts. And once again, this is nice and clean. I don't see any pellets in this. Make sure we get all those little feathers out of there. I think I'll hold them up to the sun. If there's a pellet in there, you'll see it. So this one has a little blood on it. I'm gonna just trim that off. Definitely got shot on this breast a little bit. So I can see in this one, one pellet went in right there. It looks like it came out there, but I'm just gonna cut through that just to make sure. There's nothing worse than biting into a piece of bird shot. With a little olive oil. 
salt these up. Don't be shy with the salt. I'm just going to do one side with the salt. And last but not least, a little black pepper. I brought it out here, might as well use it. Is it ready to burn? Woody, you go boy? Yeah, you go boy, you got a birdie? You have a fun day at the beach? Yeah. Cranberries are starting to soften up. Took them a while. Couldn't have picked the worst pan. What else do I got? They must have something. I found it, the perfect tool here. Going full caveman on these cranberries now. Oh yeah, why didn't I get that earlier? So I like to sear one side good, get that good and nice char on it. And then the second side, I'm gonna lower it down a little bit. Really don't wanna overcook these, they get dry. So we're gonna wanna bring these up to about 145, 150 degrees, and then we'll pull them. We're gonna add a good tablespoon of butter to our cranberries for our sauce. So this breast is there. It's at 150. I want to get it to you know 155, but it's going to keep going up a little bit. So this one's still at 130. That breast is a little bit thicker. All right, our butter is melted in our cranberry sauce. Cranberries are very tart. I'm going to hit this with a good glob of honey. This is honey from my wife's beehives in her backyard. It's amazing stuff. I mean, I'm like a big fat hairy Martha Stewart here. Quick taste of our sauce. Oh wow, that's money. That's really good. It's gonna be a good sandwich. You guys are in for a treat. You gotta to toast the buns. So close, almost there. Another minute. Nope, we might even be there. Gotta have some cheese on there. Get that cheese melted and we're there. And it's mandatory that the bird dog gets his cut. Come here, buddy. It's birdie, birdie. Oh, yum, that's very delicious. Oh boy, you like that? Oh, that's very, you cooked it just right. The bird is on the bun. We got our lovely cranberry sauce concoction here. I think this is going to be a tasty sandwich. I never made this before. Seems like it should be right on. Make it messy. Last but not least. Cheese is on top. It's a good looking sandwich. Billy's like a half a mile down the beach chasing fish. I am not going to wait for him. That, my friends, is a tasty sandwich. I shall call this sandwich the Sandy Neck.